Good morning. Uh, for those who want to follow um, Romans 1, chapter, uh, Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 17, on the Pew Bibles, it is page 1128. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who, as to his earthly life, was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in your spirit, is preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be opened for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish, that is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written the righteous will live by faith. May God bless his reading. Thank you, Ruth. Well, it's great to be able to start our new series this morning in the book of Romans. And I've called this, uh, well, it's Romans part one, and it's also the gospel part one. Romans uh, is a long book, so we're going to be tackling the first half of it in this series, but I suspect next year we'll probably pick up the second half and get all our way through it. Because this is a bit of a lengthy series, I thought we'd start with a bit of background on Romans first, just to give you a sense of what this text is all about. So the Roman church is one of the oldest churches in the Christian world. It was likely founded by Jewish people who came to Jerusalem for Pentecost, shortly after Jesus rose from the dead. In Acts chapter 2, there's a scene of people from all around the known world gathering in Jerusalem. And Peter, the apostle, speaks to them, and many turn to faith in Jesus, many of these Jewish people. And some of them, we read, are from Rome. Some of them are from Rome. And it's likely that it's these people who came to faith in Jesus on that day that returned to Rome and founded the church. So initially the church in Rome was a Jewish background church. But gradually over time, some Gentiles, some Greeks and Romans from Rome joined. So it would have had a majority of Jewish background believers and a minority of other background Gentiles. However, in 49 AD, something important happened. All the Jews were expelled from Rome under Claudius. Maybe 40 to 50,000 Jewish people were expelled. And Claudius wouldn't have distinguished from Jewish believers of Judaism and Jewish background Christians. If their, if their ethnicity was Jewish, they were expelled. So the church changed significantly at this point. In fact, it became really an all-Gentile church. Gentile believers who had previously been a minority had to step up into positions of leadership 
and continue the Roman church now that everyone with a Jewish background had left Rome. So probably for about four to seven years in the early 50s, this was a Gentile-only church in Rome. But gradually Jewish people trickled back into Rome and joined the church. Priscilla and Aquila, Paul's friends that he met in Corinth, his fellow tent makers, they were among the Jewish people who were expelled from Rome and then gradually eventually returned to Rome. But the church had changed. It was now a majority Gentile church with a smaller Jewish segment of people who had come back. And it was probably really a bundle of house churches around the city. This will become very important later on. The year is now 57 AD. A few years have passed and Paul is in Corinth. He's spending three months there at the end of his third missionary trip. And he writes to Rome by his scribe, Tertius. He's writing to this church this interesting church that he's never met. So we have this letter that he writes, the letter of Romans that we look at. And it's not a particularly personal letter because he doesn't know the people super well. He doesn't focus on lots of little interesting bits of information in the church. It's a broader message that he sends to them. And he's writing probably for three big reasons. Paul's concluding his ministry in the East He now sees God calling him west. Paul wants to go to Spain and do ministry work over there. And he sees Rome as a bit of a launching pad for his Spanish mission. So he's writing to introduce himself to these people who have never met him before he goes there. He's also keen to outline the gospel to this church that he's never met. Probably both to ensure their own credibility. A few few years have passed since they heard the gospel to make sure they're on track but also to confirm his own credibility. There's been some stories circulating about Paul. He wants to let them know the gospel that he holds to. And there is one local issue that does come up in the end of the letter, which is probably important, and that was some tension between Jewish and Gentile believers. So his letter also has this localised message of unity. Now, just to sort of fulfil the history, not that this is really part of the letter, but just so you know, Paul does get to Rome. He gets there but not in the way he expects. When he gets back to Jerusalem from Corinth, he's arrested, there's a number of trials, and we looked at this in our Acts series, he gets taken to Rome for trial. He never makes it to Spain, sadly, but he does get to meet the Roman church. But for now, he's writing this letter, a big letter, like a a treatise, like a doctrinal treatise in one sense. And it's got a pretty clear shape too, which makes it quite easy to follow. The first eight chapters are all about the gospel, this message that's at the heart of what Paul's doing. And that's what we're going to be looking at in this series. Then from chapters 9 to 11, there's a focus on the relationship between Israel and the gospel. Chapters 12 to 15, it's application of the gospel. How does this affect our lives? And then he's got a whole long chapter of greetings at the end. And like I said, we'll hopefully tackle that second half, maybe next year. Why are we looking at Romans? Why are we endeavouring to tackle this big, difficult, theologically complex book? Well, it is part of the Bible, and our general rhythm here is to work through books of the Bible. And we've never done Romans before, not since I've been here. So, it's happening. Another interesting thing about Romans is Romans has historically been a book that's been at the heart of big changes in Christian history. Romans was the book that influenced Martin Luther in his coming to realisation about faith in Jesus. One of the big awakenings that started the Reformation itself came from the book of Romans. And I think always focusing on the gospel is always a good thing to do, to consider how this message we refer to so much, we talk about, how does it really affect our lives? How does it change us and the world around us? So let's get straight into it. Let's have a look at the book. Today's reading is fairly introductory, but it sets the tone for the letter. Paul's very intentional in this, that it's all about the gospel. To sum it up, you could say, it's, today, it's all about how everyone needs to hear the gospel. Everyone needs to hear the gospel. And firstly, we read Paul's call to share the gospel to Gentiles. He opens the book like this. Oops. Paul, a servant of, of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. 
very clear from the start, this letter is all going to be about the gospel. That's Paul's big focus. And if you look through the different letters Paul writes, it's a bit of an academic exercise. But Paul loves to introduce himself using different phrases, different descriptions. And there's one phrase here that is totally unique to Romans. You won't find this in any of the other letters. It says, set apart for the gospel of God. That's unique to Romans. He doesn't use that elsewhere. His listeners, that should ring a bell for them. This is his focus. All right, but what is the gospel? Uh, we've, I've mentioned it probably a dozen times already. What is this all about? The word gospel literally means good news. Uh, a gospel was a declaration of some sort of good news, a proclamation that was made. But what's Paul's gospel? What's he referring to here? What am I referring to? Well, I have mentioned this before, but when we talk of the gospel in the New Testament, we're talking about two things. It's, it's always two things, and it's only ever these two things. It's who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And whenever you see a gospel summary in the Bible... It's these two things. Different words, different emphasis, different focus, but it's always about these two things. Who Jesus is, his identity, what Jesus has done. And Paul's got one here. There's a, there's a little gospel summary right here in these few verses. He says the gospel is regarding his son, God's son, uh, Jesus Christ our Lord. He's talking, isn't he, about who Jesus is. He says he's human. He's in the line of David and he's divine. He's the son of God. So he talks about who Jesus is, but he also doesn't forget to mention what Jesus has done. He writes of his resurrection from the dead. That is that Jesus actually died and then was brought to new life again. That's the gospel, who Jesus is, human and divine, son of God in human flesh, and what Jesus has done, lived, died for our sins, and rose again to new life. Now, there's lots more you could talk about when you talk about the gospel. Paul's about to fill eight chapters on the gospel. So he doesn't just sort of stop after five verses and say, you know, greetings, Paul, and that's it. No, he's going to unpack this. He's going to talk about the human need for the gospel, the reason the gospel is good news for us. He's going to talk about implications of the gospel. What does this mean for our life? What does this mean for the world? He's going to talk about the restoration of our lives to God, forgiveness of sins, adoption as God's children, God's call for us to live holy lives, all those outworkings. But whenever we come back to it, the gospel itself is always these two things, who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. So he says, I'm set apart for the gospel of God. And then he writes, through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his namesake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are, who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul makes it clear that he is called by God for a very particular purpose, to reach Gentiles, that is non-Jewish people. And he says to these Romans, that's you, certainly most of them, that includes you in Rome, people that God sent me to, to tell the gospel. It's a pretty long introduction. Paul could have just written from Paul, to the Roman Christians, couldn't he? That's how I write my letters. Dear Dad, love from Paul. But Paul loves to pack it out. He loves to pack his greetings with key information, making it clear he's called to share the gospel to the Gentiles. In the next section, he talks about his longing to share it with particularly the Romans. And I want to just focus here for a, for a moment. Paul, Paul makes it clear, even though he's never visited these Romans before, he knows about them. He says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his son is my witness in how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times and I pray that now at last by God's will the way may be open for me to come to you. He's commending them for their faith. They're famous for their faith. They're well known for it. It's something that is being reported broadly. And he says he already prays for them, including that he can visit them. I'll keep going. He says, I long to see you that I may impart some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I plan many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I may have a harvest among you, just as I've had among the other Gentiles. 
I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. Paul's got a few reasons. He, he's desperate to get to Rome to visit them. Firstly, he wants to encourage them and be encouraged, to share a mutual gift of encouragement, it sounds like. That's, that's fair enough. That makes sense. Secondly, he says he wants to do a bit of mission work while he's there. He's kind of, he's just itching to get out on the streets of Rome and, and share the gospel. He says, I want to have a harvest among you. He's looking forward to being out there. And if you read through Acts, this is classic Paul, isn't it? Everywhere he goes, even just for a couple of days, he's going to do some street preaching. He's going to be out there amongst people who don't know Jesus, looking for evangelistic opportunity, opportunity to share about the Lord. And the third reason is, he wants to share the gospel. He wants to preach the gospel to the Roman Christians. That might seem a bit strange. I'll read that again. That's why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. Now, I don't think he's nervous that they haven't got the gospel or they've got a like twisted gospel and he thinks, I've got to get to Rome and like straighten you guys out. You're off the, off the, off the page. You need to be sorted out. There's no sense of rebuke here. It's just that he wants to preach the gospel even to the Christians in Rome. I can definitely fall into the trap of thinking the gospel, the good news of Jesus, that's for unbelievers. That's for people who don't know Jesus. They need to hear the gospel and be saved. And that's absolutely true. The risk is I can then think, yeah, but Christians, especially mature Christians, we don't need to be reminded of the gospel again, do we? we don't, we've heard that. We know who Jesus is. We know what he's done. We need other stuff. We need encouragement. Yes, we need rich, complex teaching. We need to go deeper in our theology. We need application of what this looks like, all that sort of thing. And that's true too. The risk is that we can then, you know, tick off the gospel. Go, done that, know it, don't need to hear that again. Thanks, Apostle Paul. We got it the first time. Paul's very clear throughout this letter we never graduate from the gospel. Yes, we need other information and teaching, but even mature Christians need to hear the gospel again and again. And one of the big reasons is we are surrounded by everything other than the gospel, aren't we? That was true in Paul's day when the Roman Christians were surrounded by other worship practices, other displays of power, other messages, other ways of life. Day by day, that's what they saw. They walked out in the street, that's what they saw. It's the same for us today, isn't it? The gospel message is a rare message. We don't hear it often out on the street at work with other people. It's not coming up constantly. We hear lots of other messages, some of which aren't ideal, but we don't often hear the gospel. Even mature Christians need to hear it again and again. And so Paul says, I want you to hear it again. Roman Christians, I'm going to share it again with you. Now, at this point in listening to the letter, some of those Roman Christians might have been thinking, Paul, you're obsessed. You're obsessed with the gospel. You need to back off. You're starting to sound a bit weird. Just, just ease up. Just relax. Why are you so obsessed with this message? You want to share it with the Gentiles? That's great. You want to share it with us Roman Christians? We've kind of got a good handle on it. Thanks very much. Why is this such a focus for you, Paul? And so he says in a couple of verses, why? Why he's so obsessed with the gospel? why he's going to keep writing about it. And this is what he says. And these are pretty famous verses. He writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Paul is moving from his kind of intro into the meat of the book, the, the teaching about the gospel. And his first phrase is, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of this. For any readers thinking, Paul, this is starting to get embarrassing, he says, no, I am not ashamed. Here's why. Firstly, he says, it's the power of God that brings salvation. It's the power of God that brings salvation. And implied in here is that people need salvation. People are lost people are in need without the gospel. And this is true. Over the next couple of chapters, Paul's going to be very clear about the lost and sinful state of humanity, the, the need for a rescuer, for a saviour, for someone to pull us out of this mess. 
Now, in Paul's day, the reality of being lost or needing God or, or, or gods, that was a pretty understandable concept. Today, this is probably not as commonly accepted. Today, most people wouldn't see a need to be rescued or saved. Most people would say, I'm not perfect, sure, but I'm, I'm not that bad. I'm not that bad. So Paul's going to spend the next couple of chapters outlining the lost state of humanity just to make it super clear everyone needs a saviour, salvation. So the gospel is the power of salvation. Secondly, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Now, <clears throat> a, lot of, a lot of ink has been spilled over these particular phrases, but this is where I land. The righteousness of God here likely refers to a righteous or holy or good status that God gives us when we confess our sins and trust in Jesus. Righteousness, holiness, it's not our default state, as I mentioned before. We are sinful, we are unholy, we are unjust. But Jesus is perfectly holy and righteous and good. And as we confess and trust in Jesus and what he's done, Jesus gives his righteous status to us. Oh, it's a little clunky, but there was a, an image. I'll just, I'll just fly through there. It's coming up, coming up. There we go. <clears throat> Showing that, that transfer of our guilt being credited to Jesus on the cross and Jesus' righteousness being credited to us. The righteousness of God is revealed. And thirdly, <clears throat> the benefits of the gospel are for those who have faith for those who believe. Paul makes this really clear. This is how people benefit from the gospel. It's for those who believe. It's by faith from first to last. Faith, belief, really dependent trust in Jesus. That's how people receive the benefits of the gospel. Salvation from the penalty of sin and this amazing gift of a righteous status before God. Most other religions and faiths, and this was true both in Paul's day and in our day, require something else something other or something additional to faith and belief. It could be a regular ritual you perform. It could be a place you need to visit. It could be something you consume, something you do to your body, a meditation process. Paul's going to make it very clear in Romans, you can't actually earn your righteous status before God. You can't earn your salvation. No ritual, no holy living is going to get you there. Our salvation, our rescue, it's only secured by what Jesus has done on the cross, dying for our sake and rising again. And the way we receive this benefit is through faith, through trusting in what Jesus has done for us. This is why Paul's not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation, to rescue people. It reveals this gift of righteousness from God to us, and these benefits are received by faith. So this is what we see from the opening verses of Romans. Paul's called to share the gospel to Gentiles, He's keen, he's, he's chomping at the bit to get there to Rome to share it with them. And the gospel is the message of salvation. Or let me go back to my summary from the start in case you've had your eyes closed. Everyone needs to hear the gospel. Everyone needs to hear the gospel. That is what Paul is on about. So what does this mean for us? Let me ask you two questions. Firstly, do you trust the gospel for your salvation and righteousness? And maybe for some listening today, and maybe for some listening online, this is still a live question for you. Whether you've heard about Jesus before, or maybe this is the first time, this is the most important question you're going to have to consider. Do you trust in the gospel for your salvation and righteousness? Do you recognize your own tendency to wrongdoing and confess that to God, knowing that as you do, because Jesus died on the cross, your sin and wrongdoing is forgiven and you receive salvation, rescue from the consequence of sin. And God now looks upon you as righteous, as holy and good. Let me encourage you, if this is a decision you haven't made before, receive this offer of salvation that God makes. In a few minutes, we're going to receive communion and there'll be a chance there to pray to God and then to receive from the Lord's table. But I also know many here have already received this gift. They already trust in the gospel of Jesus. You already trust in who Jesus is and what he's done for you, which is wonderful. So my question for you is this. 
Are you captivated by the gospel like Paul is? Are you captivated by the gospel? Paul wants to make it clear, everyone needs to hear the gospel. Everyone needs to hear. He's, he's so committed to this message, he sounds like he's obsessed. Now, we may not have the same specific calling the Apostle Paul did. He knew God's call on him to certain people in his day. But does the gospel, does it excite us? Does it, does it occupy us? Does it indwell us like it does for Paul? I want to be honest, it's hard and it's maybe impossible to try and manufacture excitement or energy, isn't it? I get that. So what I'll just do, I'm going to share from my own experience. Because I am sometimes captivated by the gospel, if I'm being honest. And I'm captivated by the gospel when, usually when I see its alternatives and I realize how special this message is. This is not a constant feeling for me, but it does strike me at particular times. <clears throat> I'm captivated by the gospel when I see particularly young people, but anyone, feeling crushed by their own imperfections. People who don't feel tough enough or cool enough or attractive enough or confident enough. That search for perfection based on your own achievements, your own ability, it's a heartbreaking message. And to this the gospel says, God loves you. And your value in God's eyes has nothing to do with what you can achieve. This is how you know God loves you, because he gave his life for you on the cross. I'm captivated by the gospel and by the power of the gospel when I see powerful people exploiting the poor and weak with no consequences, using wealth or connections to escape justice in this life. That is heartbreaking. And to this the gospel says, God is a just judge. Sin and evil will be judged. And we know God takes this seriously because Jesus died on the cross to fulfill God's justice. I'm captivated by the power of the gospel when I hear of people, usually famous people, who did something foolish in the past. Sometimes something racist or sexist. And they show deep contrition and remorse. And yet, society does not forgive them. They are forced out of their public roles. Some of them struggle to find work. To this, the gospel says, when you truly confess your sins to God, he forgives them so completely, so deeply, it's like they never happened. You have a clean slate before God. That's the message of the gospel. And to get even a little bit more personal, I was captivated by the power of the gospel, particularly regarding that last example. Maybe about 15 years ago, I was working as a volunteer in a, a Christian student ministry team. And one of the team members had a moral indiscretion, and she knew it, and she confessed. And our goal as a team was to make sure we reflected God's attitude to her. She was forgiven by the team, and she was restored. And she commented in a very real and raw way the power of forgiveness that she experienced, both from us, but particularly from God. The power of the gospel to restore her. Let me encourage you, if you find it hard to be captivated by the gospel, let me encourage you to keep your eyes open. See the world through this lens. See how the world fails to stack up to this amazing message we have. Give thanks to God for his justice and his mercy and be freshly captivated by the power of the gospel. Let me pray. Lord God, we thank you so much that you came to this earth in the person of Jesus Christ, born human at heart God, God in human flesh. And we thank you that you gave up your life for our sake, taking on yourself the punishment of our own sin and indiscretion and, Lord, giving us this amazing gift of righteousness. And, Lord, that death did not defeat you, but on the third day you rose again, conquering death, opening up the pathway to new life for all who trust in you. Lord, that's an amazing message we have. And I pray that as we explore the depths of this message over the next few weeks, you will just excite us afresh, captivate us afresh by the joy and the power of the gospel. Amen.
Well, we're now going to share communion together.